Muhammad may peace be upon him he will say these are my people who took Quran for foolish nonsense most of the commentators say that the reference to these people my people is mainly referring to the people of Quraysh many didn't believe but I'm asking you that today won't there be Udbas like those people who accepted the message and then went back and who were led by their friends and they went against Islam won't there be many Muslims who will be like that person so it also refers that we should not take Quran for foolish nonsense we Muslims Alhamdulillah we respect the Quran but what we do we kiss it and keep it on top you should respect the Quran but Quran is not only meant for kissing and keeping on top it's meant to be read it's meant to be understood and it's meant to be implemented and put it into practice now there are some people who ask me that which translation should I read there are several translations available I would like to tell you that whichever language you know the best you read the translation in that language if you know English read it in English if you know Hindi read it in Hindi if you know Marathi read it in Marathi if you know Urdu read it in Urdu whichever language you know the best whichever is your mother tongue the psychology they tell us that the language in which you swear and the language in which you dream that is your mother tongue in short the language which you can write, which you can understand, which you can speak the best is your mother tongue. So whichever language you know the best, you read the translation in that particular language. Now since this lecture is in English, I would like to present a few translations which have already been done by several scholars here. The translation which I personally recommend is of Allama Abdullah Yusufali. Alam Abdullah Yusuf Ali was born in India, in Bombay and then migrated later on to Pakistan I prefer this translation because Alam Abdullah Yusuf Ali he took about 40 years to translate this Quran there is no other translator who has taken such a long time not that he did not know Arabic well but he wanted to translate it perfectly to the best of his effort but still he says that he was not able to do a good job and he always says according to my understanding even after doing a research for 40 years and another translator Maulana Abdul Majid Daryabadi he took 7 years and he said if I would have known in advance that translating the Quran would have taken 7 years I would never have started translating it and this man Abdul Aziz Ali he took 40 years and besides that the English of this Quran Alhamdulillah it is beautiful if you know English this is the best translation even if your English is weak and if you want to improve your English I would advise you to read Allama Abdullah Yusuf Ali it's as good as reading Shakespeare it's better in fact your English will improve and besides that this particular translation gives a word to word translation eye to eye translation there are some translations which are paraphrasing means a few verses combined together and then the translation is given in Abdullah Yusuf Ali every verse every verse has been given the translation word to word for example Kul means say Kul who Allah has say he is Allah one and only one verse in Arabic besides that is the translation one verse in English same thing Allah Hussamad, Allah the Absolute, the Eternal it is giving aya by translation, word to word translation so even if you don't know Arabic by reading the translation several times you will understand the meaning of several words for example, Kul means say Ahad means one so like that, if you read several times you can understand several meanings of the Arabic word and besides that this translation has a very beautiful and a concise index most of the translation don't have an index but if you want to know if you want to know what does the Quran say about marriage to look under M to look under M and there it will tell you that to the unbelievers you refer to Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse number 221 and finding chapter 2 
Verse number 221 is very easy because every page is numbered. Every chapter is numbered. It's very easy to find. Because we, as laymen, where will we find Surah Bakra? Where the Khari read for me, Surah Kamar? Where will you find Surah Kamar? In the big encyclopedia. Where will you find it? You have to look on the queue, it will tell Surah number 54. And finding Surah number 54 is very easy because every page is numbered. If you want to know about divorce, look on the D. If you want to know what the Quran speaks about Muhammad, may peace be upon him, about a messenger, look on the M. If you want to know what the Quran speaks about Jesus, may peace be upon him, look on the J. Ready reference, what do you want to know? It's at your fingertips. Therefore, I personally recommend that if you have to read a translation, I would prefer you reading Allama Abdullah Yusufali. But, if somebody tells you, I want to read any other translation, no problem. At least read it. Whichever, whether it's Muhammad Asad, Darya Badi, any other. At least read it. Don't give excuses. But if you, take, if you want my opinion, if you want to read one translation, read this. There's another translation called the message of the Quran, translated and explained by Muhammad Asad. Muhammad Asad, he was a Jew who reverted to Islam. His previous name was Leopold Beth. And he has written several books. So he is very well versed with the English language. And later on he went to Saudi Arabia and learned Arabic as a language and then he translated it. Second, after Abdul Yusuf Ali, I prefer Muhammad Asad. Because he has translated decently. Abdul Yusuf Ali in 1934, 1937, several years ago, more than 50 years ago, this person, he translated it in 1980. And unfortunately, he has just expired last year, Muhammad Asad. He translated in 1980, and what he has done, he has mainly paid emphasis to the meaning to the root meaning of the Arabic words. And besides that, he has touched on those topics which other translators have faulted. Who have faltered. The other translators where they have faltered or where the different opinion, he has paid more emphasis to those portions of the Quran. So if you want to do more depth study after Abdul Yusuf Ali, I would prefer you reading Muhammad Asad. If you want to know that which translation of the Quran will help you in a comparative study, in dealing with the non-Muslims, in dealing with the Christians, in dealing with the Hindus, I would advise you to read by the translation called Tafsir al Quran by Maulana Abdul Majid Daryabadi. He took seven years to translate it. And in his footnotes, invariably, invariably, very often, he has quoted the Bible from Ezekiel, from Genesis, from Matthew, from John, from Luke, and also quoted various Hindu scriptures, giving reference in which way does the Quran correlate with the present Bible, in which way does it differ. So if you want to do a study only on comparative, I would advise you to read by Maulana Abdul Mizdariyabadi. It comes in four volumes. This is only the first volume. Then there are other translations written by Maulana Abu Allah Maududi. This is also a very good translation. It was originally written in Urdu and later on translated. This is the second revised translation by Zafar Ishaq Ansari. Maulana Maududi gives references, he gives historical references, also references from the Hadith, etc. But it comes in six volumes, in six big volumes or in sixteen small volumes. It is very voluminous. If you have the time, go through it. Otherwise, I would advise you Alam Abdullah Yusuf Ali. If you have the time, it's very voluminous. You can go through Abu Lala Mawduti. It is a very good translation. And, and I would prefer the revised edition by Zafar Ishaq Ansari. Because this revised edition is a better translation than the previous one which was done. Then there are other translations of Muhammad Mahmudu Pithal. But it is very concise. For a person who wants to know the literal meaning, this is good. But to have understanding only, I would not advise you to read the translation by Pickthall. If you have, after reading other translations, to compare, it's fine. But initially, only reading this translation, inshallah, you will get a lot of guidance. 
but I prefer you reading my other translators. If you want to know the message of the Quran in a very simple, easy English, the best I can recommend is by T.B. Irwin, Thomas Dallas Irwin. His Muslim name is Al Hajj Talim Ali. He's an American. His English is beautiful. It is good for those people whose English is weak. But if they want to improve their English, you read Allah Abdullah Zafali. But if they don't want to improve their English and want to understand the Quran, I would advise them to read by T.B. Irving. But unfortunately, this translation is not available in the Indian market. The translation which is available is of Pictol, of Allama Abdul Aytipali, and of Darya Badi, and maybe of Arbi. This translation of Arbi is the best translation I feel which is written by a non-Muslim. Arbi. It is written in a poetic form. He has not been biased like the other translators, like written by Sale, etc. They have given you a distorted figure of the message of the Quran. This translator, Harbi, though he's a Christian, I feel he has done a very good job. Before ending my talk, I would like to give just a last quotation from the Quran, from Surah Al-Hashr, chapter number 59, verse number 21, which says that if we would have revealed this Quran on a mountain, it would have humbled itself and would have cleaved asunder in fear of Allah. Which if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have revealed this Quran on a mountain and if a mountain had feelings, it would have humbled itself and would have cleaved asunder. We would have fallen down in utter ruin for fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now when anyone talks of a mountain, immediately two things come in our mind. One, the mountain is very big and secondly, it is very strong and stable. So when the Quran if it would have been understood by the mountain, it would have fallen apart. But unfortunately, the Quran is revealed to us human beings and also all the creatures in the world, but to us human beings, to us mankind, it does not make any difference. We kiss it and keep it on top. Why? Because we don't understand the message. If we would have understood the message, we too would have fallen apart. We would have followed the message in fear that we will be sent to the torment of hellfire. So, I would like to say that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq and guidance and help us to read the Quran with meaning and with understanding and show us the Sirat al Mustaqeen that is the straight path. Akhru Dawan Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Now we come to the last part of the program, that is the most interesting one, that is the question answer session, where the audience will be allowed to take part by asking questions. But as we are having time as a limiting factor, thus we have framed some rules and regulations which have to be adhered very strictly. First of all, the question should be related to the topic. I repeat, the question should be related to the topic. Secondly, the question should be as brief as possible, not more than one or two sentences. And thirdly, this is a question answer session time given to you, not a debate time or a lecture time. And now we have this mic over here and we are distributing this mic and whoever would like to ask a question, we are handing over this mic to him or her alternatively and you can raise your hands accordingly and we will give you a chance. Now we will start with it. Mr. Dr. Zakir Bhai will be handling the question answer session. And now try to, if you can, please introduce yourself before asking the question. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Shain Virani and I am a revert Muslim. Brother Zakir, can you please tell me why was the Quran revealed in Arabic?
to start with the question, why was the Quran revealed in Arabic? I will tell you that you may be knowing that the Quran was revealed in Arabia. So if the Quran was revealed in Arabia, but natural, it should be revealed in the language in which the Arabs understood. So since it was revealed in Arabia, that's the reason that the Quran was revealed in Arabic. If it would have been revealed in French or English, the people would not be able to understand the message. The first reason that the Quran was revealed in Arabic was because Arabic was the language of the people of Arabia. And secondly, the Quran had to be revealed in the mother tongue of the person to whom it was revealed through. It was revealed on Muhammad be peace be upon him. It had to be revealed in his mother tongue. Because if it was revealed in any other language, in French, and suppose he went to the Frenchman and gave him the message of the Quran, the Frenchman will tell him, what do you understand by this French language? French is my mother tongue. Therefore, I can explain to you this Quran in a better way than what you can do. That's why it had to be revealed in the language which was the mother tongue of Muhammad, may peace be upon him. Thirdly, Quran. It was revealed in Arabic because Arabic is a very rich language. It is one of the richest languages on the face of the earth. Most of the words of Arabic, one word has got several, several meanings. Sometimes two, sometimes three, sometimes thirty, even sometimes sixty. One word. So since Quran was a telegraphic message, it could be given, if you say one word in Arabic, like for example, Rab, it means Lord, it means Sustainer, it means Cherisher. So if it was revealed in English, it would have to be said, Lord, Sustainer, Cherisher, and a big line of words. So the Quran would have become more voluminous. So in a telegraphic message, one word has got many meanings, and Arabic is a very rich language. So in a short way, a deeper understanding of the Quran can be given. And lastly, if you see and analyze the languages of the previous scriptures who claim to be scriptures of God, like the Bible, the Old Testament, the New Testament, which was revealed in Hebrew, Aramaic, Ancient Greek, they are all dead languages. The scriptures of the Hindus, revealed in Sanskrit, they say. Revealed in Sanskrit, they say it's revealed. I don't say it's revealed, they say it's revealed. It's in Sanskrit. Sanskrit is a dead language. How many people in this world know ancient Hebrew, ancient Greek, Aramaic or Sanskrit? Only a handful. Only a handful of the people in the world know these languages. So, to take the people for a ride is very easy. That's the reason they have revised editions of the Bible. Every, every few months they have a new edition of the Bible. Why? Because majority of the people don't understand the language in which it was revealed. But Arabic, Alhamdulillah, more than 100 million people in the world today know Arabic. And Arabic is a living language and will inshallah remain a living language till eternity. Hope that answers the question, sister. Answer my yellow, Randy. Salaam alaikum, Zakir Ankar. Alaikum asalaam. But what is the meaning of the inshallah? My young sister, the young lady, she has posed a very good question. Since they are talking about reading the Quran's meaning, she wants to know what is the meaning of the word inshallah. Inshallah. It means God willing. Or if Allah wills. If you translate it on one word in Latin, it's Dio Volente. Dio Volente. Meaning same. Inshallah. Means if Allah will. But unfortunately, today we Muslims, if you want to avoid anything, we say Inshallah. Instead of saying no, if you want to say no, that if someone invites you, that come for this lecture. Go 
کوشش کریں گے انشاءاللہ 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 مس نو اف ڈونٹ ٹو کم ضرور آئیں گے ضرور آئیں گے ہنڈریڈ پرسینٹ آئیں گے اٹ از اے رانگ انشاءاللہ ایکچولی مین اف اللہ ول مین فرام مائی سائز آئی ول پٹ ہنڈریڈ پرسینٹ ایفرٹ بٹ اف اللہ ول بیکاز ایون اف آئی پٹ ہنڈریڈ پرسینٹ ایفرٹ اف اللہ ڈز ناٹ ول آئی کین ناٹ ڈو اینی تھنگ ایوری تھنگ ہیپن ود دا ول آف اللہ سبحان و تعالی بٹ انشاء اللہ مین دیٹ آئی ول پٹ آل مائی ایفرٹس not that because i'm feeling sleepy i won't come or because i'm tired i won't come that's not inshallah i will put 100% effort then if god forbid khuda na kare allah na kare if something happens like i expire or if i have accident then i will not be there but inshallah means i will try 100% and if allah is with me i will do that thing but unfortunately we don't avoid in a muslim community we say inshallah for avoiding but actually inshallah means if allah will Thank you, Dr. Lachet. You have to click the mic out here. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. I want to know... If uh, it is a reality or joke which you quoted about Nizam, if it is reality from which book, which year, which Nizam? Nizam is the title. That's right. Brother has posed me a question that the incidents I gave about the Nizam of Hyderabad, is it a joke or is it a reality? It was an example, brother. It was an example. If you ask me, is it a reality from which book, from which historical book, I cannot tell you. It's a reality and it could have been taking place in, in many ways. Even today it can take place. If you go to a village, I mean, I'm not talking about motors. <laughs> for a motor car, even the village has experience, but in another field, if you want to take them for a ride. Like, I was giving that example in relation to, just an example, which can take into, which example you can put into practical life. For example, if you go to a village, and you will surely come across a person who believes that the world is flat, a few people, whatever it is. So to convince the person, a villager, who has not any knowledge about science, that the world is flat, it will be very easy. To convince a villager that the moon is made of chalk or it's made of cheese, it will be easier than to convince a person who is educated. In the same way, if you're educated and if you have knowledge, you cannot be, you cannot be made a fool of. So I give that example, just an example. And in reality, maybe both things may have happened. It is not from any book. Maybe it has happened in reality, I don't know. So same way, we should read the Quran, at least understand the basic message, so that no person who claims to be a scholar can take you for a ride. Hope that answers the question, brother. Are there any questions on today's topic? Al-Quran, should it be read with understanding? Are there any questions on Al-Quran? Should it be read with understanding? Do you want any clarifications? Or do you have any misconceptions? Or do I agree that everyone here has understood that the Quran should be read with understanding? Yes. Excuse me. Well, yes. I'm Masood. Uh, can we offer a salah in uh, any other language other than Arabic? For example, English, Hindi, or Urdu. Is it necessary in Arabic? Brother has posed the question, is it necessary to offer a salat only in Arabic? Can we offer it in any other language like Hindi or English? First, in short, the answer is, it is a fard that you should offer in Arabic. But, what is the reason? Because we Muslims, we believe in unity. We Muslims believe in unity. We should always be united. Therefore, we should pray in one common language. Now, if you tell me, and if I agree with you, that let's pray, let's do a salah in English language, so that people can understand better. So now the Qari is reading, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, instead of that he's saying, in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Now you say, I don't want to read the translation of Allah Abdullah Yusuf Ali, I want to read the translation of Muhammad al-Piktal. He says, in the name of Allah, most beneficent, most merciful. Again, there is a conflict. You will say, if you want to pray in English, you pray the translation of Pictal. You will say, pray the translation in Muhammad Asad. 
with the translation Allah Mabdullah it will there will be a conflict and as I said the Arabic words cannot be translated 100% because Arabic Quran is the word of God the English translation is not the word of God it's the translation of the word of God which can have errors so in the translation if you read the translation we can make errors and many a time many a time we may we may misunderstand the message many a times so we don't want to attribute this mistake to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's the reason that we pray in the original revelation which is in, in Arabic for example you will say that I understand English better some people in the mosque will say I understand Urdu better so again we will have fight whether you read the prayers in English or in Urdu or in Marathi even if I agree with you that read in one particular language of one particular translator after having the conflict suppose I am a person who travels a lot I go to France, I go to Germany etc and there there is a Qari or the Muazdin the Muazdin is giving the Azan now if the Namaz is prayed in English or French even the Azan should be given in French I go there and I don't know what the time for prayers I don't know the time for prayers and the Muazzin is telling in French instead of saying Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar Allah is greatest, Allah is greatest he's saying something in French which I can't understand so how will I come to know as the outsider that he's calling me for prayers I know English, I don't know French so how will I come to know that the person who's shouting he's calling me for prayers and when I go to pray when I go to pray the person, he reads the translation in French what guidance am I getting? I can't understand French. I will not know what is he reading. Is he giving me guidance or is he abusing me? I won't know it. So, we have to read the Salat in Arabic. That's the only way. But, if you ask, suppose a person has reverted. He has reverted to Islam. He does not know Arabic as a language. He does not know how to read also. He has just reverted today. So, if he prays in English, will it be acceptable? I said, Inshallah main thing is the niyyah by the time he is learning how to read in Arabic if he reads in any language because God understands all the languages but not to create a confusion among ourselves we have to read the authentic revelation not any translation but by the time he is learning Arabic which may take sometime one week may take two weeks may take a month till that time inshallah Allah will accept his prayers whether he reads it in English whether he reads in Gujarati or in French but as a whole, the Salah should only be prayed in Arabic. Hope that answers the question, brother. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Farida Ansari. Brother Sakir, you said that we must learn Arabic language to understand Quran. Is there any organization which conducts classes in Arabic language? Thank you. Sister, I posed a very good question. She had asked me, since I have given a solution, the solution should be applicable. It should be applicable. And she asked me, is there any organization which teaches Arabic as a language? Sister, there are several organizations which are teaching Arabic as a language. Like recently, Indo Arab, if you want to join, is going to start from the 15th of, of Jan. The course is for three months on Arabic language. But I do agree that they will teach you only spoken Arabic. These classes are mainly meant for those people who want to do a job abroad. I would advise you to join classes which mainly deal with Quranic Arabic. We had in our organization, the Islamic Research Foundation, we had a course, a very crash course, a short course for two months. It was supposed to be for four months, but due to the rights and etc., we had to cut it short only for two months. It was taken by Professor Ali Naktare. He is the professor of Arabic language in the Bombay University. And we paid emphasis on Quranic Arabic. Inshallah, we have taken new premises below our present premises at Dongri. And after a new auditorium of the Islamic Research Foundation will be ready. It will take a few months. We will inshallah be conducting Quranic Arabic classes. So, if you're interested, you can take the information from the Islamic Research Foundation and we'll be stressing more on how to understand Quran directly. Hope that answers the question, sister. 
السلام علیکم وعلیکم السلام بتا ہاؤ ول یو پرو دی اوتھینسٹی اف دی قران ٹو ا نان مسلم سسٹر ہیز پوز دی کوسچن ہاؤ ول یو پرو دی اوتھینٹیسٹی اف دی قران ٹو ا نان مسلم سسٹر دیٹ کالز فار ا بگ سیمینار اٹ 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 ویل ایٹ ٹیک ا فیو اورز مینیمم ٹو پرو دی اوتھینٹیسٹی اف دی قران If you want the complete answer I would request you to take the cassette from Islam Research Foundation I had given a lecture earlier a few months ago on is the Quran the word of God and there I gave a lecture for 2 hours still I feel I did not do complete justice for 2 hours and proved how can you prove scientifically and logically that the Quran is the word of God and how can you prove the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by using science but but Now since you have posed me the question, I would not like to completely put, it, put the question aside. I will just give only a couple of points. Suppose there is a non-Muslim. Suppose there is a non-Muslim. You ask him that suppose a villager comes from the village and tells you that the world is flat. Will you believe in it? He will say no. So you have to ask him why. So he will say, because the world is not flat. But the villagers will say, I believe in it, because my father has said so. But a person who is educated, he will say, just because your father says the world is flat, the world does not have to be flat. You are doing blind belief. You are doing blind belief. You have to pose my second question. That if you see an object, some object which no one in the world has seen, maybe an electronic equipment, a computer or something like that which no one in the world has seen you have to ask that non muslim who will know the mechanism of this electronic object who will able to tell you and after a lot of try he will tell you the first person who will tell you the mechanism of this object is the creator some will say it is the manufacturer some will say the producer don't grapple with the word whatever he says whatever she says you accept it whether it's the creator, producer or manufacturer. But just keep it in mind, he has said it is the creator or he has said it is the manufacturer. Then you go further and then you give various points, various scientific points which are mentioned in the Quran. You post your non-Muslim friend that, that when did, how was this, how did this universe came into existence? So he will tell you that initially there was a big bang. And the theory of Big Bang is there. In 1973, it was propounded by two scientists who got the Nobel Prize. That there was a Big Bang and everything separated from the primary nebula and there were secondary nebula. There were planets and the sun came, the stars came, etc. So you tell that non-Muslim friend that the same thing is mentioned in the Quran from Surah Al-Anbiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30, which says, أَوَلَمْ يَرَ الَّذِينَ قَفَرُوا أن السماوات والأرض كانت رتكا ففتقناهما that do not the unbelievers see that the heaven and the earth were joined together and we clove them asunder now how is it possible that this theory which is describing the big bang theory in a nutshell how come this verse is mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago he will say maybe it's look you don't argue don't argue with him then you go further When did you learn? Previously we thought in science, previously, that the light of the moon was its own light. But now we know that the light of the moon is reflected light. Same thing the Quran says. The Quran describes. It says the word for moon is Kamar. It describes Kamar as a noor, as reflected light. And the sun is called as Shams. It describes as Siraj, as a light of its own. Now how is it possible this thing was mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago? Again he will say it is look. Then you go further. When did we learn in science that the plants had male and female? And in plants they had sexual characteristics. He will tell you yesterday. In science yesterday, with hardly 50 years ago, hardly 100 years ago we discovered that the plants had male and female. This thing is mentioned in Surah Taha. Chapter number 20, verse number 53, that we have produced the plants in pairs. You can go on sister, according to Dr. Maurice Bukhel, there are 857 scientific verses in the Quran 
and not a single has been proved wrong. After every scientific point you say, you pose the question, how come, who wrote this Quran? Who wrote this Quran 1400 years ago? Quran mentioned, the Quran mentioned about the water cycle. Who could have written it that time? Quran mentioned about the blood circulation. Quran speaks about physiology. Quran speaks about the unseen barrier between salt water and the fresh water. Who could have written it 1400 years ago? After every question you pose to the non-Muslim, who could have written it? Initially you say, it's a fluke, it's a guesswork. But if you keep on posing, pose it till 850 times, then finally you will say, the creator has written it. The creator, the manufacturer, the producer, and you say, this creature is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So by this, he will agree that there is a creator and he has to agree that this Quran is the word of God. And there are various other ways of how to prove it, but for that you can refer to the video cassette of is the Quran the word of God. Hope that has answered your question in a nutshell, sister. We will be having, inshallah, after the question and answer session, if the provisions are being made, we may have the Jamaat Namaz, inshallah, out here after the question and answer session. Assalamu alaikum, Amishra. Brother Zakir, I would like to know what are the bases on which the names of the chapters are given in the Quran? For example, the Surah, uh, Surah Bakra means the cow. But very few verses are mentioned in the chapter which are related to the cow. Sister has posed the question, <coughs> on what basis are the titling or the heading of the different surahs given in the Quran Sharif? And she has given an example, that Surah Baqarah, it means the cow, I do agree with you, some say heifer, it's the same thing. And in that Surah Baqarah, hardly a few verses maybe 62, 63, verse number 62 to 67, it deals with the heifer or the cow. So when only a few verses out of the 286 verses of Surah Baqarah deal with the cow, how come the title of the surah is given as cow? Firstly, I'd like to tell you that the title of the cow, or the, sorry, the title of the surah need not be, need not be the same subject. The major portion of the surah need not deal on the topic of the title of the surah. Like as you mentioned Surah Bakra, it does not, the full surah does not talk about cow. Only a few verses regarding the slaughtering of the cow. Now why was the titling given in such a fashion? Because normally to remember words like cow is much more easier. I can give you more examples. For example, Surah Nahal, meaning B, hardly three verses. 66, 67, 68, 69. Three, four verses deal with B. But still the whole surah is titled as Surah Nahal, Surah B. Same thing with Surah, Nahal, surah Namal, Surah number 27. And only two or three verses deal with that. When Solomon and his army, when they come to the lowly valley of ants, one of the ants said, Get ye into a habitation, unless Solomon and its army, they trample us. Only two or three verses dealing with ants, but the title is the ant. Same thing with Surah Ankabut about the spider. Only two, three verses. So how come this title is given in this manner? Because it is more easier to remember spider, cow, ant, or bee, or elephant, Surah Feel, for Surah Hadith, Ayan. So need not be, the title of the surah need not be the major portion of the Quran is talking. If you see other verses, sometimes the chapter is given on the word which occurs in the first two verses. Like Yasin, Quran al-Hakim, title of the chapter is Yasin, chapter 36, Surah Rahman, Ar-Rahman, Alam al-Quran, it's coming in the first verse. So since it's coming in the first verse, it's given as the title of the surah. Surah al it's coming in the second verse. Sometimes, if it comes in the first two verses, it's mentioned in the title. Sometimes, since it's easy to remember, cow, bee, etc. Many a times, it's given on the names of the Prophet. Surah Ibrahim, Surah Muhammad, Surah Yunus, may peace be upon them all. 
So the title need not be the major content. And I would like to tell you that the Quran was not revealed together. Like the Bible is written in a story form. Quran was revealed in stages. The first few ayahs of the Quran were revealed of Surah Alaq, the first five ayahs. Then Surah Muzammil, then Surah Mudassir, and so on and so forth. Then Surah Fatiha. And Surah Baqarah was not revealed together. A few verses here, a five verses, then maybe ten verses. So, depending on that, depending on the revelation, the revelation was not given from verse number one to verse number 286. That's the reason for easy to, for, for remembrance and depending upon whether it comes initially or the name of the Prophet, the title has been given. Hope that answers the question, sister. Hello. I wanted to know if uh, there are any prominent Muslims who are really working against our topic today or is there any recognized Jamaat which you can name which is working. Otherwise, uh, we never read any book without understanding. So how this actually subject came up? Brother wants to know that is there any prominent Muslim or is there any prominent Jamaat among the Muslims I believe? which is against this theory of Al-Quran, should it be read the understanding, and how come this topic came? The topic was brought about, brother, because many people when we meet the Muslims, they say, now you ask me many prominent Muslims, I, I know many Muslims, I cannot, I don't know what prominent, I don't know if they are prominent or not, but there are many Muslims. Who, in fact, majority of the Muslims say that the Quran should not be read with meaning. And if you do a survey, brother, if you do a survey, and I believe you'll agree, majority, more than 50%, some people say 80, some people say 90%, or whatever it is, but you have to agree, the majority of the Muslims say that the Quran should not be read with meaning. And they give excuses like the one I've mentioned. It's only meant for the alims, that we don't understand the Arabic language, etc., etc. So these are the logical arguments they give for not reading the Quran with meaning. Regarding any Jamaat, there are several Jamaat. Most of them say, a couple of them who say should be read with meaning. So you can take as a whole. I don't want to label anyone, but as a whole, most of the Jamaat, again, as most of the Muslims say, most of the Jamaat, most of the organizations say, it should not be read with meaning. And they give the argument. There are very few organizations which say, an Islamic Research Foundation, and Islamic Center of Education, are one of the few organizations which say that the Quran should be read with meaning. Hope that answers the question, brother. Excuse me, I repeated the rules and regulations for you. This is not related to the topic, to be more precise. You should not ask such questions because it's possible that you take a name of some organization like, you know, like uh, possibly the topic was Al Quran should it be read with meaning. But to right. ask about it, whether it should be read with meaning or not. The topic is that. You are not asking about a particular faction whether they are doing it or not. The main question over here is whether it should be read with meaning or not. You have to deal with it. And secondly, I had a question for Mr. Zakir that he had used two sentences over here for the topic. It is whether Quran should be read with meaning or whether Quran should be read with understanding. Now I feel that there is a difference in the words meaning and understanding. I give a simple example. I see two persons fighting on the road. I may perceive that the person who has hit him has done it a very bad thing. He may be an innocent person. And the other person may perceive that the person has hit him, it's good, because he must have done a bad thing. That means the act of the Quran can be the same, but the way of understanding it can be different. So now how can you explain me this concept like? Brother, I suppose the question, what is the, between the word understanding, that if you analyze, there are two types of reading of the Quran with meaning and understanding. It is Tadakkure Quran and Tadakkure Quran. Tadakkure Quran means reading with meaning. And the one of them says that just, you want to understand, you can understand the Quran. But if anyone says that I have understood the Quran completely, that is, you have read the depth of the meaning. There is no one at present in this world living now today who can say that I have understood the Quran completely, 100%. Therefore, understanding also has level. You can understand the Quran as a whole, as a message, but no one in the world can say that I have understood the Quran in toto. Because even if you read a hundred times, if you read the hundred and first time, you will get more guidance. Because the depth of each word 
of the Quran. It's so deep. It's difficult for anyone to reach the bottom most part of all the words. It's difficult. Therefore to understand the Quran is possible, but to, and to read the Quran is meaning is 100% possible. To understand the Quran is possible, but to understand with 100% understanding, going to the bottom most part, no one in the world can say that I have understood the Quran 100%. He need not read the Quran anymore. Hope that answers the question, Mr. Chairman. Is there any questions related question. to the topic yet, brother? Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. My name is Norman. I would like to ask you one question. I don't know the exact chapter and verse. In Surah Bakra, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, We have sealed their heart and their ears. So whatever message is given to them, they won't understand. So do you think Nauzbillah Allah to be so cruel with we human beings? Well, that's for the question that in Surah Bakra, he's quoting verse number 567, the two verses which says, <clears throat> that we have seen Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala we have seen the heart that among the kafirs the world arabic word is kafir that the kafir those who are bent on denying the truth it is it makes no difference whether thou wantest them or do not want them it makes no difference allah has put a seal on the heart and the hearing now allah is telling that allah dina kafiru is the word here word used here that these kafirs, those are bent on denying the truth, whether thou wantest them or do not want them, it will make no difference. And Allah has put a seal on their heart. Here mainly two questions arises. First question is that if Allah has said that on the kafir Allah, it makes no difference whether they want them or do not want them, what's the use of doing dawah to the kafir? That's a very logical question. That if it doesn't make a difference whether you want a cafe or do not want a cafe, it will make no difference. So why should we do dawah? First question. Second question, isn't Allah unjust by putting a seal on their heart? If you wouldn't have put a seal, they would have understood the message. Answering the first part. The meaning of a cafe, normally people think that anyone who is a non-Muslim is a cafe. The exact translation of the word cafe, it comes from the root word kufar, meaning to conceal meaning to conceal anyone who conceals the truth anyone who denies the truth is the kafir kafir does not mean and it does not mean a non-muslim because if you read the Quran in Surah Hadith chapter number 57 verse number 20 the word kafir is used this is the only time in the Quran where the word kafir does not mean concealing the truth it, it is given an example that a, a farmer, a person who tills the soil, he conceals the seed in the soil. He is called a kafir. In this context, the word kafir means to conceal, that's all. Besides this particular verse, leaving this verse aside, everywhere else where the word kafir is used, it refers to concealing the truth. But one place in the Quran it means only concealing. Concealing the seed. The farmer is concealing the seed in the soil. Here yeah, it does not mean concealing the truth in the soil. Fine. So the real meaning, the exact meaning of kafir comes from the root word kufr, meaning to conceal or to reject. In the context of the Quran Sharif, all the places except for hadith, concealing the truth, rejecting the truth. But if you analyze this particular verse of Surah Bakra, it does not say only kafir, it says Al-Ladina Kafaru, means those who are bent on denying the truth, not those who deny the truth. It's not merely those who reject the truth. It means those who are bent on rejecting the truth. Those who are bent on denying the truth. Those it will make no difference whether thou wantest them or not want them. Again there's a reference in Surah Kafirun. Kulya ayyur kafirun ala abudu ma taabuduna wala antum abiduna ma abud wala ana abidum ma abadtum wala antum abiduna ma abud lakum dinakum wal yaddeen That say to all those who reject faith that you worship not what I worship, I worship not that which you have been worshipping. Nor will you be worshipping which I have been worshipping, neither will I be worshipping that which you will be worshipping, to use your way to meet mine. Now let me explain to you the meaning. If I tell you that do you agree with the statement I made on the 5th of July in the year 1990, do you agree? You will ask me, how can I comment? I don't know what statement you have made. So to reject, to say whether you agree or disagree, 
you have to know what statement I have made. Same way, to agree or to disagree with the truth, to agree or to reject the truth, first you have to know the truth. So it is the duty of a Muslim to deliver the message of truth to every non-Muslim. And only after the message is delivered, and only after he rejects it, can you call him a kafir. Because, or can be possible, he has got the message of Islam. But he has got the wrong message of Islam. He thinks Islam is a ruthless religion, they are merciless things, they keep on killing, so he rejects that Islam. So he has rejected the false Islam. So there is no harm. So it's your duty to present the correct Islam to the non-Muslims. And only after a person has got the message of right Islam, of the truth, and if he rejects it, can you call him a kafir? You will be in a safe position. And Allah has said it will make no difference whether thou wantest them or do not want them to those people who are bent on even after delivering the message of truth to them one time, ten times, twenty times, hundred times still they keep on rejecting it on those people it makes no difference whether thou wantest them or do not want them Allah has put a seal on their heart Allah has not put a seal on their heart in advance Allah knows in advance that this particular human being he is a kafir he will keep on rejecting the truth and Allah knows that irrespective however much dawah you do to him however much the message of truth you tell to him he will not listen to the message so Allah has put a seal it is not because Allah has put a seal that is rejecting because that kafir is rejecting has Allah put a seal it is a vice versa so it is his fault that Allah has put a seal it is not because Allah has put a seal that he has been rejecting the message it is a vice versa so you cannot blame Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for putting a seal. It is because they have been rejecting the truth and Allah since he has ilm gap he has knowledge of the future and everything else. In advance he knows this particular person will be rejecting the truth and that's the reason Allah has put a seal. So Allah is not unjust. Hope that answers the question brother. Thank you. Excuse me. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa My name is Professor Bilal. I am a revert. And my question pertains to a reference you made in your speech. You said that a person gets ten sawabs mm. when he recites each word of the Holy Quran and you cited an example of Alif Lam Meem. Mm. If this is true, I want to ask, will I get ten sawabs in your terminology? If I get, will I get ten sawabs if I recite the word Iblis, which is also mentioned in the Quran? <laughs> but that was the question that I said. You get ten sawab if you read Alif Lam Meem. I said, the scholars say, the Alim, the Maulana, I have got no objection, that you will get ten sawab, Alif Lam Meem, ten, ten, ten. Any word of the Quran you read, you get sawab. That's a very good question you ask. That if I say, Iblis, 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 and if I make a Tazbi, if I make a Rosary, of Iblis, 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 will I get sawab? If you read without meaning, you will not get sawab. But, if you read with the meaning saying Iblis is a Satan, Iblis behind your mind is a Satan, Iblis is a Satan and then if you read Inshallah you will get Sawab but if you read only Iblis, Iblis without knowing meaning thinking that you are praising him you will not get the Sawab <laughs> that's a very good question brother excuse me Zakir Bhai some Muslims say that the Quran should be read with meaning only for the Alims but uh, they also give an example that uh, Alim has a pakka license and common Muslim has a kacha license. If a person having a pakka license bag sakar or something or commits any mistake, he will get more punishment according to the laws. And if a person having the kacha license makes any mistake while driving the car, he will get less punishment. So it's better by giving this example they say uh, Alims have a Pakka license and common Muslims have Kacha license. It's better to leave, our, leave it to the Alims only for understanding the Quran. And we should only recite Quran. My brother has posed the question that he has given an example which among those people who say that reading Quran with understanding is not necessary. And this is a common example given by the Alim. If you can, if you can identify the Alim, it is fine. If you can't, you can ask this gentleman where he has got this reference from. And he has posed the question that these Muslims, they say that if you have a kacha license, and they also say that after you fulfill the requirements, 
of having an helplet in the front, helplet behind, and having a person who has a pakka license beside you. If you bang up a car, you get less punishment. But if you have a pakka license, and if you bang up a car, you get more punishment. So it is better to have a kacha license and get lesser punishment and not to understand the Quran with meaning than to have a pakka license and get more punishment. I agree with them that if you have a kacha license and if you bang up a car, you will get lesser punishment. Maybe you will be given a fine of 1000 rupees. If you have a pakka license and if you bang up the car, if you have an accident, you are given a greater punishment, maybe a penalty of 2000 rupees. I have got no objection in that. But the second statement I have objection. And to clarify that I will tell you that suppose in a year a person carrying the Pakka license, he may have an accident only once a year. So he ends up paying a fine of 2000 rupees in a year. But the person having Kacha license, he will bang up the car 50 times. So he will pay a fine of 50 times into 1000. At the end of the year he ends up in paying a fine of 50,000 rupees. The person having a Pakka license ends up in paying only 1,000 rupees. So still, a person having a Pakka license is at advantage than a person having a Kacha license. If this were not the case, you ask the Alib, why did he get the Pakka license? If it is better to have a Kacha license, how come he is having a Pakka license? He knows that having a Pakka license is better. He has, the Alib has less chances, if you understand the Quran, he has less chances of doing mistake because he understands the message. And secondly, even agreeing with him, he normally give a person a rope to hang himself. The Quran says Surah Bakra, give them a rope so that they will, they will go to and fro like the blind person. Surah Bakra, chapter number 2, verse number 15, 16. So you agree with them. So you tell him, even if you have a kacha license, and if your person sitting next to you, the person with a pakka license, if he speaks in a language you don't understand, you don't understand Arabic, he's telling you in Arabic, buy the brake marrow and you put accelerator. What will happen? You have an accident. So you tell your alim that to have a person sitting next to you, he should, he should speak in the language you understand. And he should be able to translate the message to you. So the person sitting next to the person having a learner's license, he should know the language and should explain to him what it means. Then only will he be able to understand and drive the car properly. Hope that answers the question. Are there any more questions on the topic? Al-Quran, should it be read with understanding or meaning? We can entertain a couple of more questions before we end the session. One Your more brother? question to come. That's fine. Bhai sir, may... Please. My name is Tamila Sheikh. Brother, if I am passing from temple on Monday and there if I see people doing Sheikh sh- idol worship, if I don't go and stop them, am I in fault? Sister has posed a question. Thank you. Which is not related to the topic, but since we allowed one gentleman to pose a question, we should not do injustice. We can also allow another sister from the sister's side to pose a question out of the topic. She has posed the question that if she is traveling or if she is going down the lane and she sees a temple where people are doing shirk, if she does not stop them, is she committing a sin or is she doing a crime? I would like to quote a hadith which says that if you see anything wrong being done, any believer, sees anything wrong being done. Firstly, if you can, you should stop it with the hand. If you cannot stop it with the hand, you should stop it by speaking, by, by talking. If you can't do that, at least you should curse in the heart that this particular act is wrong. If he does not do that also, he is not a believer. If you curse in your heart, you are the lowest category of believer. If you don't do any of these three, you are not a believer. So if you see a person doing shirk, if you know that friend, if you think you can stop him with your hand, do it. If you feel there's a big gunda on the road, he's doing shirk. But naturally if you feel you're getting scared to stop him, if you can tell him by mouth, tell him, shirk karta hai. If you can't do that, at least curse in your heart that what this person is doing is wrong. If you don't curse, then you will be committing a crime. If minimum at least curse in your heart that what this person is doing is wrong. 
and inshallah you will not be held responsible hope that answers the question yes uncle one ah bete make sure you one minute one wait tell me sorry yes uncle ki ye jo between meaning and understanding jaise har ek who's over many normal person i feel should be just doing that in all cases that he tries to analyze himself and mentally satisfy himself with the meaning of what he reads for an average person i don't go above the average or below the average just an average person so ye shock करीब करीब हम में से हर एक में होता है कि थोड़ा बहुत तो जानने की कोशिश करते हैं बट वेन इट कम्स टू अंडरस्टैंडिंग द मीनिंग ऑफ कुरान अब जैसे आपने छह किताबें बताई उनमें से दो चार एक आध के मुझे भी पढ़ने का इतफाक हुआ है तो वट आई फाइंड कि बाज वक्त विद द लिटरल मीनिंग खुद अरबी जवाल इतनी वसी है कि उसके बहुत सारे मान्य होते कि देर इज ए सेंस ऑफ समटाइम्स ए what should i say lot of confusion creates or it becomes difficult to what exactly it means that you are left in a weak capacity make example leke aapko karunga ke inna atina kil kausar fasal li rabbi ka banhar ye jo banhar hai iski main koshish kar raha tha apne dil se ki kya hai samajhne ke liye is pe aapko zara roshni dal sakenge ke how should they man with a normal understanding with a normal sense of rational thinking should satisfy himself while he reads or tries to understand quran in his own way angela posed the question that when we read the translation of the quran many a time we are not satisfied with the meaning and as one arabic word has got several meanings he wants to know what he should do and he has given an example of inna tana kal kausar and there are many such examples many several again you have to follow the quran normally in some verses you it is very clear cut for example kul wallahu ahad say that allah one only you read whichever translation whichever translation you will get the meaning say that allah one and only what over it is. you will not you will get the clear cut message some eyes are crystal clear some eyes little bit you you have the intelligence to get the eyes crystal clear some eyes like a mention for imran chapter number 3 verse number 7 that we have made among the quran some verses which are basic and fundamental some which are unestablished fine so now if there is any problem any problem you do not understand a particular verse you can refer to various translation that what we do you are talking about one example i can give you several examples but you have to follow the quran quran says in surah furqan chapter number 25 verse number 59 ask the person who knows as the person who is well acquainted so if the quran is talking about arabic language you can ask an alim or a maulana who is an expert these people who have written also alim and maulana so you read this particular verse it says this particular for example i like to give an example which people <laughs> make it enlightened who it says that that we when we men it's not said men when we go to jannah we get who most of the translators have said hood means a maiden with beautiful eyes hood that translated that so there was a question asked to me during the islam research foundation question and session that the gents will get hood beautiful ladies what will the females get <laughs> it's a very good question and believe me this question had perturbed me for a very long time i read several translations and everyone said most of the translators said beautiful maiden with big eyes so as quran says as the person who knows i asked many alim maulana some people gave the translate a meaning which even maududi gives he says that you know the good ladies they will be converted to hur and then they will get you fine satisfied but not very satisfied with the answer finally i came across the meaning of hur given by muhammad asad as i said muhammad asad is very good if you have problems if you have any problems first book you should refer i feel these type of hur problems a problem of kafir the answer i gave of kafir was from muhammad asad it solves most of the problem by muhammad asad now he tells us he tells us that hur does not have a gender it is like azwaj azwaj means spouse what is a spouse if it is referring to a man it means wife if it is referring to a lady it means husband spouse same way hur has got no gender 